<laughs> Today, it's all about cine lenses. Real cine lenses. And I'm going to be discussing reasons why true cine lenses are a more practical investment with greater efficiency for on-set workflows. And you're definitely gonna wanna stick around for the end because I have a little personal story to share where I was using one of my favorite vintage lenses on a job and unfortunately, it did not survive. But first, the matter at hand. Last October, I put out a video on all the reasons why I sold my modded contact Zeiss lenses and replaced them with the Zeiss Milvis. But I also mentioned at the end of that video how I wish I would have invested in true cine lenses instead. And the reason why I said that is because I had already been researching cine lenses months before I even released that Milvis video. Because remember, I owned the Milvises for an entire year before I even put that review video out. So here we are, 10 months later, and the Milvises are gone, and I am so pleased with their replacements. Because as much as I love the image that the Zeiss Milvises capture, I just could not stomach to do one more day working with cine modded photo lenses. And last week I released a little teaser trailer as a way to showcase my latest investment in these new Schneider Krosna Xenon full frame prime cine lenses. You know, and I really do love these lenses. There are zero regrets this time. And it probably has a lot to do with the fact that I researched for over a year before I made my purchase. So that little teaser trailer called Xenon was my idea of a lens test. But in order to tell you why I chose the Xenon specifically, I think first I should tell you some of the reasons why I was getting so annoyed when using modded photo lenses on set. But on top of that, I'm also gonna be talking about the things that I look for in a lens before I purchase it, for any of you that are interested in that, um, you know, specifically considering cine lenses, because again, I was researching them for about a year. But first, my experience with modded stills lenses. And it doesn't matter if it's vintage or modern, at the end of the day, it's still a photo lens. And speaking to you as someone who owns a small production company, whose motto is literally filmmaking for the underdogs, trust me when I tell you, the smaller your crew is and the tighter your budget is, that is the most crucial time when you need gear performing at its optimal results. Photo lenses weren't designed to match each other, so they're all various sizes with different lengths, way different focus throws. So what does that mean? That means you're going to have to move your focus motor every time you swap a lens, but on top of that, you're also going to have to recalibrate it every time you do a lens swap. These old lenses are not designed for the torque of those focus motors. The auto calibrate on any focus motor over time will destroy your precious gems. So now not only do you have to unclamp the motor, reset it to match the different size lens that you now have on your camera, but you're also going to have to, or you should be manually recalibrating it. Let's say you have a shoot coming up and you look at your shot list and you notice that to pull that shot list off with the time allotted and the coverage that is required, it's gonna take you about nine different lens swaps to complete that entire day. That's only about three different setups with actors with very basic minimal coverage. And take that number nine and times it by five, the amount of minutes it'll take to do each one of those lens swaps. Well, now that's 45 minutes total that you will have wasted on set just swapping the lenses alone. And focus motors are finicky, especially if you're like me and using the Tilta Nucleus M. Wouldn't you rather just mess with that motor one time in the morning and never have to touch it again? It's just so much more efficient. And that's the biggest beauty of using something like these Xenons, just setting that follow focus once and leaving it right where it was. And honestly, all the issues with the follow focus motor that I had with the Zeiss Milvises and all any lenses before the Milvises, you know, dealing with that for five years, I just finally had enough and I said, I'm done with this, I'm getting real cine lenses. You know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot more issues when dealing with modded photo lenses. Image shift and focus breathing are two major things. Even when I got my Leica R's CL-Aid, 
image shift is still a thing. It's part of the internal mechanics of some of these old lenses. It's in there, it's in there. The only way you can get rid of image shift is with an actual true rehouse. But the biggest thing that I was looking for or desiring more was better looking bokeh. And not just better looking, but more consistent as well. But with most photo lenses, actually all photo lenses in my experience, as soon as you start stopping down, the f-stop changes shape. Some people, they actually prefer the weird bokeh from the, you know, the old AEG contact Zeiss, or some people like the Leica R bokeh. Me, I'm just not a fan of it. I like nice, round, consistent, creamy bokeh. That is one of the amazing things you get with the Xenons because of their 14 blade iris. Now, another thing that was really not a problem with the Milvises, but it can be a way bigger issue, specifically with vintage lenses, and you already know what I'm gonna say, the issue and problems with building a color matched set. Guys, the reality is photo lenses just weren't made that way. None of these manufacturers, certainly before the year 2000, were designing any lenses for photography, making sure that they all matched. Photographers don't care about that. These are all things where cine lens manufacturers really hone in on, making sure that the colors and skin tone renderings match. There's nothing like a solid, true set of matching cine lenses, matching not only in the optics, but also on the outside as well. Here is one of the biggest deal breakers, and then I'll shut up about it, okay? And this is something else that no one talks about. It's the difference between f-stops and t-stops. I was a gaffer for two years and I was always working with a light meter. I always work with a light meter when I'm doing my own DP work. This f-stop versus t-stop thing is something that always threw me. So the f number on a lens is its focal length divided by the diameter of its lens pupil. Whereas the t-stop, okay, controls the transmission of light through the lens. So in other words, the f-stops are for calculating depth of field, while t-stops are for setting exposure. And why this matters so much is because when you take this little 50 millimeter Summicron right here and you set it to f2, it's not going to match this 90 mil Summicron when it's also set to an f2. Versus a set of true cine lenses, okay, when I put both of these bad boys at t2.1, they will all be the same exact exposure, no matter what focal length. For people doing music videos and stuff, maybe that doesn't matter to you, but if you are shooting a narrative thing with multiple coverage, that's pretty damn important. I don't care if it's single cam or multi-cam, you know, it's usually off by a third of a stop. So that is something that legit causes inconsistencies on the day if you're not aware of it and looking out for it. Okay, but I do wanna say this because I know someone's gonna mention this. If you are a super wealthy individual and not only wealthy, but you have tons of patience um, and you can rehouse your vintage lenses, then that will actually solve the majority of your problems. So, you know, you know I understand that too which that probably brings me to the elephant in the room. You know, I keep talking about these Leica Rs and then, but still talking about how much I don't like using modded photo lenses. I, you know, I've been sneaking these Leica Rs in and out of YouTube videos for the past few months. I actually started collecting these last November. I really just bought them as a business move because I kind of saw it as like a savings account that I could later on cash in on. <laughs> so that was more of a business move rather than a filmmaking decision. And you know, that's something we talk about over on the the Dog Times Patreon all the time, running as a business, because we are a business, you are a business, I am a business, and you know, we should be thinking as such. Which is a great segue to finally why I chose the Xenons. Schneider Optics. Now here is a company with a well-known and highly regarded reputation within the professional film industry. And they have designed these Xenon lenses from the ground up, and not just in the housing, but in the optics as well. And even though these were actually inspired by the original Xenon lens, which was first invented way back in 1925, these Xenon full frame prime cines are a whole new recipe. They have not recycled the glass from other lenses, nor have they just simply rehoused photo lenses, which is actually what a lot of other big lens manufacturers do in order to you know, sell affordable cine lenses. This is not the case with the Schneider Xenons. 
These are completely original with their own unique optics. And of course, as you know, they were obviously made for cinematography, so they match perfectly as a set because they were designed to do so. And because of the inspiration from the formula of the original Xenon lens from almost 100 years ago, the image they render is uniquely pleasing. Now, a few folks have commented on the CA or chromatic aberrations, but to me, it's really only most noticeable on the 35 because it definitely is the worst offender. And I think that's because the 35 was the first one made for the set, but don't quote me on that. However, me being a lover of vintage lenses, even though I know it doesn't seem like that, but you know, actually the optics of the vintage lenses is what I'm in love with. I'm not in love with the old crappy build of a photo lens. Um, for those reasons though, CA doesn't really bother me. Because remember, these lenses were inspired by the original vintage Xenon, which came out almost nearly a hundred years ago. So in my opinion, these Xenons are quite literally in a class all of their own. And I do have a test that's going to be uploaded in the very near future, because I already did it, where I compared the Xenon 35 to this Leica 35 Summicron. So be sure you tap that subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss out on that video when it drops. All things considered, these Xenons are still pretty affordable cine lenses, especially when you compare them to their bigger brothers, the Xenars, which some of those are double the price. There is zero plastic, anywhere inside or outside of these lenses. Each one is meticulously crafted for optimal performance and then is carefully checked for flaws before it is released to the buyer. Schneider has a wonderful three-part video series where they walk everyone through their labs. It's quite awesome. I'll leave a link down below. In fact, these lenses are so unique that to buy them brand new is a special order directly from Schneider. Now, granted, that's probably because at this point, these lenses are now nine years old. But with that being said, Schneider is still actually producing them, at least for now. <laughs> for all I know, they're just, you know, still selling old stock. But, you know, that does mean that they're still out there. However, with what I just said, that kind of shows that these bad boys are inching towards a pre-level of vintage themselves. The first thing that really grabbed my attention about these Xenons was that 14 blade iris. It creates a perfect creamy round bokeh no matter what t-stop you set it at. The breathing is very, very minimal. And as far as the look goes, when I did a blind test on Instagram, everyone thought these were old vintage lenses anyways. And I didn't use any filtration on that blind lens test. So they really have stayed true to that original Xenon character from 1925. It's really quite uniquely pleasing. Now, I certainly cannot get away without talking about lens flare. And in that aspect, the Xenons do at first kind of remind me of the Milvises, where you have to kind of work kind of hard to get them to actually flare, mainly just with the longer focal lengths from the 35 and up but I will say that the wider options do have a little bit more character in the flare department. And when you talk about a truly matched set of cine lenses, the Xenons are definitely in that group. They are the same exact size and weight, same diameter, same length, same awesome 300 degree focus throw. That's why the wider you go with the Xenons, the more expensive they get because Schneider had to figure out a way to make this 25 mil and even the 18 millimeter match the rest of the set, including the 100 millimeter. So that's a nice big range of lenses to all be matched in size. Not to mention the 18 millimeter Xenon is one of the fastest 18 mil professional cine lenses for full frame. Notice how I said professional. <laughs> In my opinion, it's certainly the gem of the entire set. However, it is $6,300 brand new. So it'll be quite a little while till I can grab that one. So now you know why I've held onto the 18 millimeter Milvis. Uh, so yes, stay tuned because we will be on the hunt to find a matching wide lens to go with the Xenons. Either way, guys, I love the Xenons, and I also love a strong company making unique products. And you know, I've been using and owning Schneider filters since the first year of practicing cinematography. I mean, their filters are hands down my most commonly used filtration on sets. You know, and clients look at a gear list and they don't even have to be in the industry, they are instantly going to recognize that Schneider name. And the best part is, even though Schneider has such a strong reputation, they still act like a little boutique company. And why that matters is because of the attention to detail. 
Now, are these lenses perfect? No, not by any means. But for me, it was that 14 blade iris, full frame coverage, excellent build quality, and they render a classic, warm, vintage-like image. They really do have optics that are truly unique. A look that other DPs have called reminiscent of old ingenue or cook lenses. So you combine all that with the fact that they are matched perfectly in size, so you know they will provide you 100% efficiency on set. And that is why I had to stop using modded photo lenses, even for passion projects. Actually, I should say, especially for passion projects, because again, there is even less time and money on those passion projects. Don't set yourselves up for failure. So now let me tell you a little story about how I lost my Tokina Ingenue 28 to 70 f2.6 zoom lens. That is one of my most popular videos. May she rest in peace. I got hired to shoot for three days as the cinematographer on a little job and I went out with that Tokina Anji zoom lens, day one, right out the bat, within the first hour, this happened. And that is because of the Misfit Atom. I had been using the Misfit Atom with two filters in it on the front of that Anji zoom lens for quite a few projects up to this point, and it just went, man, it completely split that lens in half. And you know, that's a pretty hefty vintage zoom lens. So this is why I say, guys, just another downside of using uh, modded photo lenses. I say it all the time, they are not designed for clamp on matte boxes. Their internal mechanics are not designed to hold the weight. So what happened to me on that job, uh, luckily, you know, the client wasn't there, just the, you know, the people I was filming. And I was like, hey, you know what? It's really hot out here because we were outside. I was like, you guys need some waters? Yeah, I'm going to go run and get some waters. I didn't tell anybody that the lens broke because that was the only zoom. It was, it was like I was filming like it was Verite style, you know, so I had to have a zoom lens. At that time when that lens broke, that was the only zoom lens I had outside of the 11 to 20. And I wasn't going to try to shoot the whole thing with an 11 to 20. So I ran to film tool and luckily we were close enough and I ended up spending quite a bit of dough to replace that Tokina lens that day and basically made zero money because it, the amount I paid to replace the Tokina was almost what I made on that shoot. So, you know, it's just like, whew, you know, it's like I keep saying, you know, um, vintage lenses are not always the most practical solution. And here's the deal too, guys. I know the Xenons are not going to be in everyone's budget, but the reality is you can always rent or, you know, there actually are a lot of options out there nowadays for affordable cine lenses. With that being said, our buddy Charlie over on the Dog Times Discord brought up a very good point. If you are dropping some serious dough on cine lenses, you it's wise to make sure that they are PL or can at least be easily converted to PL, especially if you are someone who likes to rent your gear. PL mounts are always gonna be a greater ROI. And that's just another bonus of the Xenons. They are easily mount swappable and they come in lots of different varieties. You can get them in PL, EF, Nikon, or even Sony's E-mount. And it's very easy to swap the mounts. I actually had to swap the PL mount for an EF mount on this 25 mil. And, you know, I just went with EF. I stayed with EF because, well, that's how I got a couple of these cheaper because they were EF. But also, as a lot of you know, I invested in the Kipper Tie adapter a long time ago. So because of that, you know, my particular mount is just as sturdy as a PL mount would be. However, it's nice to have that option for when the day comes when I want to go back to PL. So if you think about everything that these lenses have to offer, it really is a solid deal. And in my opinion, the Xenons really do trump all those other affordable cine lens options that are out there nowadays. Now, finally, things to pay attention for when you are researching and shopping for cine lenses. The bokeh, how it changes during iris pulls. Do you like the shapes it changes into? Do you like what it's doing? Is it smooth or hard edged? Those are things to look for. Breathing, watch the corners of the frame. That is the quickest way to spot breathing. Build quality is huge. You don't want any plastic parts. Uniformity, not only in the optics, but also in the size and weight. You want to get as 
closely matched perfect set that you possibly can. Obviously the image. Do you like the image it renders? I don't know, only you can tell yourself that. Do you like the flaring? And also, speaking of that, watch for ghosting or inner reflections. That is a huge thing, especially with vintage lenses. And finally, are they somewhat future-proof? Are they full frame? And can you easily swap out the mounts? Now there's a lot of cheap options that come to mind when going down that list, but here's another thing I'm going to throw at you, and that is reputation. What is the reputation of the company? Are they long-standing in the professional film industry, or are they just some random Kickstarter company? And if it's not a name that is standard in our industry, then start doing a little bit of digging and research on that specific company. Is it a legit optical company? Or is the owner, like if it is a new startup, is he someone that has worked for other lens manufacturers and what were those lens manufacturers? Or are they just a company that makes other film products and then just one day started randomly spitting out cine lenses? Or are they just rehousing photo lenses? These are all legitimate things that are happening. I'm not gonna throw any companies under the bus, but if you spent a year doing research like I did, you'll also come to know. I'm just sharing with you all how I came to the choice that I finally made. And don't get it twisted, uh, you and I both know there are plenty of other strong options that are way more affordable than the Xenons. And that's where availability versus budget is also going to come into play. Sometimes, uh, you just get presented with an opportunity and you just can't say no. But also, I should remind you, I am not a fan of following the herd. Ever since grade school, I have been notoriously known for walking my own path. What I mean by that is find the lenses that speak to you and don't let some sponsored YouTuber with over 100,000 subs convince you into what you need to buy. I guess what I'm trying to say here is don't make any impulse moves based upon what you hear and see on the internet. And I'm included in that, right? Everybody says I'm a whack job, so just remember that too. You know, we all are entitled to our own opinions. Why? Because, hey man, this is a visual art, right? And with that, you're gonna get some pretty wild eccentric people. But that's a good thing. But you need to embrace whatever your individuality is. And as cinematographers, the reality is uh, the lenses and the filtration is the beginning of that equation, in my opinion. But also just remember, it took me a whole year before I finally pulled the trigger on these Xenons. Because this was a hefty purchase, let's just face it, um, whether they were second hand or not, either way, you know, money is money. I'm not a trust fund kid, uh, you know, I'm not getting rich off this YouTube channel, and I don't even have parents that I can call to help me out with this LA rent, okay? So, you know, I have been uh, providing for myself since a very long time, right? So there's nothing special to me, right? It's just, I am a business mentality kind of dude. And for me, it just made more sense to invest in these lenses because I work in this industry full time. Um, if I had to rent every time I had to go shoot something, uh, you know, including on top of that, I'm making content for YouTube and Patreon every week. You know, it's just, if it's a smart investment, then it's a smart investment. If it's not, then it's not. Only you can know that, right? I didn't make this video to convince everyone to go out and buy these, because I don't have the whole set, okay? So just pump the bricks, man. I Let me get the whole set before you start buying these things up. But I don't think that's gonna happen, you know? that's th These things are pretty expensive, but I don't know, maybe you would. I did convince one of our Patreon members. He, he bought the 50 mil, so <laughs> I don't have the 50 mil. I'm like, oh my God. So I, I was a little cautious about putting this video out, because, you know, I was like, oh man, I only have three, but I'm pretty satisfied with the three I have. Please, please don't buy them all up. <laughs> I'm trying to, um, you know, build a full set here and it's gonna take me a long time, all right? So I'm just saying, guys, okay, my rich friends out there, pump the brakes, all right? Let me get the entire set and test them all out for you. <laughs>
I love that uh, you guys are still watching the channel. Um, I love the support. Thank you for watching. If you're new here and you're like, what the hell is this wild dude with the red face? Then tap the subscribe button, hit the bell, share with your other wacky friends and let everybody know what's going down. If nothing else, maybe we can shed a little bit of light on this crazy trend hipster shit with the with the lenses and 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 I get it you know you, you got to do what you got to do and and when you're on a budget sometimes it does make sense to use like Russian lenses because that's all the money you have I mean you can get those for cheaper than a set of Rokinons and they are far gonna outperform Rokinons let's be honest right and literally those were the first lenses I had was the Russian lenses but again it was the issues with the weird I, I mean I didn't have the money for the rehouse they weren't even doing real rehouses on those back when I bought those but a lot of issues with the original ones you know the iris is backwards and it's super close to the camera and and they're all over the place f-stop t-stop it's crazy that's why i went to the rokinons and then the rokinons were trash so then i went to the contact zeiss you guys know the journey if you don't if you're new here check out the backlog also i gotta give a shout out to my dog times patreon that is where i break down all the jobs that i work on here in los angeles so maybe that's something you want to check out i don't know 60 people they love it and i gotta give a shout out to the members of that patreon producers tier which as always is Mike Skinner and Fred Parr. And also I have this weird little YouTube membership thing here. And uh, if you're a Pro Tips member, uh, I usually try to put out a, a, a video I try to get one out once a week, but not always, but they're just little pro tips. Sometimes I'm on set, sometimes I'm just randomly somewhere, or sometimes I'm in the studio. But either way, uh, if you are a member of the pro tips uh, tier, I give you a shout out as well. And our one pro tips member is Visit VR. Okay, guys, thank you all. Um, it's been good. It's been fun. We'll see you in the next one. That's a wrap. Was I like, wait, I love that I give myself a haircut. I'm like, whoa, hey, look at me. Like I'm talking, they're like, dude, this dude is like, why, why did I have the camera like that? God damn. Well, now I get to go into the edit and see how bad. What if, what if like half the video I'm like this? Yeah, you guys should really get these lenses. <laughs> Jesus, who writes this shit? <laughs> the, is that the ice cream, man? Go get me a minion pop. Yeah, I want a minion pop from the ice cream man. Ice cream man. Did y'all see my A24 hat, dog? See my A24 hat? That's what's up.